this talk is a little bit different to what you've seen thus far uh, within within this conference, within PyData, in fact, as a whole. You have two people from uh, the information security industry, that's myself and Adam, uh, and information assurance domains, and you have one, yours truly, data scientist, who's presented at PyData before. And what we're here to do is tell you how we can gather information about you using public sources that actually results in knowing stuff which is quite private. Um, so we're just going to take you through a little bit of theory to start with and then focus on the machine learning bit and the analysis that's undertaken. And we're, we're defining a new concept as well, which is that of degrees of separation of, of the data that we use. Um, so a little bit of background. Uh, Adam has extensive knowledge in, in academia. He, he works in uh, uh, in the financial sector here in the City of London uh, as a, a risk manager. Um, Neri, um, I think the highlight of academia was your master's degree in, in machine learning and you're now consulting here in, in, in the UK uh, in, in the same field. And myself, well, a little bit like Adam, but with some, some more years of experience. Okay, what are we trying to do? So, this is the tricky bit. We're trying to get non-public data about you, but without hacking you, without actively attacking you. And we want to use what's already out there on each of us. Um, how do we do this? Well, we'll collect data at mass. So think of you know, the government privacy versus security debacle that has just come up again. Um, we focus on individuals, subjects, which we're likely to find more information on. So think about how you feel about reading someone's descriptor on Twitter, right? Um, and we mine and combine those data sets uh, to basically get new data sources that we go and mine and infer whether or not we've got information on our subjects. Okay. But before we do any of that, let's just look at a little bit what uh, we get taught in the space of information assurance and information security. So if, let's say, that you decided to shift your career now from what you do into the world of uh, profession, professional penetration testing, uh, security testing, vulnerability management, uh, risk management, risk assurance, risk control, you'd probably have to sit an examination after all the vetted checks and. Uh, everything added up that you're not a criminal uh, and you would have to know something like this. This is a security model. It's the uh, Bell Lapidula security model and basically it says that you've got different classifications of data um, and a subject, I'm a subject for each subject, basically cannot read data up and can also not write data down to different levels. So let's make this a little bit specific to individuals and not governments or organizations. So if someone comes at me point blank and says outside of the atrium, what's your date of birth? I will not give them that information. So I'm not allowing them to read up on a specific data set on me. And at the same time, uh, very often uh, information that you've trusted on public locations online um, has then gone and published that information. Um, so your date of birth is probably something that we can easily harvest by just looking at um, your uh, academic profiles, as, as one example. And we'll go through that in, in more detail. So a little bit of theory. There's this thing called data classification uh, security models. Bella Padula is one of them. And there's very set rules as to how these behave. The reason why we're all here is because there is a tendency in today's social media and online present websites to constantly be writing down information. So we give something that we trust people with and then they take that bit of information and basically make it available under certain conditions. Okay, so, well, let's look at that a little bit from just a, if you like, data gathering perspective. So there's a lot of public data out there. Um, we all know the term of Googling 
each other, right, to find out who we are and so on. Uh, and that's represented by the, the big sphere that you see here. So over time, of course, that lens changes. So if we look at the public data that was available 20 years ago, it wasn't that much. Uh, we went through a phase in the 90s and early 90s where we would register openly with most online platforms. Um, next to that public data, we have what we consider confidential or more, if you like, um, personal information, things that we don't share, but it's quite closely affiliated with our public uh, personas out there. All the different dots that you see here represent different sources. So basically within the public data domain, uh, we can, uh, oops, within the public data domain, we can go and look at specific focus areas. And Neri and Adam are gonna take you through a very extensive analysis example of that. Then there's things that really secret, so you don't want people to find out. Things that your other half knows, things that your mother knows about you, um, and that's you know that, that's up here. And then dare I say we're all human, so there are things that we've all done that we're not particularly proud about, and probably will never want to repeat again. And some of us don't have any such things. But there are things that basically you don't want to come out. Now, just don't focus on the individual. Think of organizations. Think of governments. Think of uh, fraternities. Think of different groups of people behaving in this manner. Uh, different organizations have different classification models. So instead of having four categories, if you're in the government sector, you have something like seven. If you're in the US government, I think it, there's, there's even more layers there that the NSA provide. Uh, and there's also uh, further classification models. Uh, in the UK, we have, I think, at the upper echelons of top secret, um, the code word, which is specific projects which form a further bubble, if you like. So there's ways that we classify data, and there's also different lenses that we look at that data based on the sources available. Okay. So what are we here to define then based on, on all this information? So I'm not going to read out all, all this slide, but basically what we've stumbled across is that if you take the information that you find on a particular subject, which is probably public, and then you combine that with another source that's also public, very often you get something about that particular subject, which is not so public. So let's think of an example of this. So if you take the fact that I've shared with Google Plus that my birthday is in April, and also you combine that with some of the feedback on my Twitter feeds around the time of April, immediately you can infer, with a certain probability of course, um, what my year of birth was. And, well, similarly, the day. So we call that just adding a degree of separation to that data set. So a degree of separation on a particular data is our ability to basically combine that data with another set of data sources of the same classification in order to find out something that we didn't know before. Okay, enough theory. Let's go through how we do this. So this is now the segue into machine learning, which is we've got all these classifications, and really what we've done is we went and extracted features. And we give you some examples of features, and we stay away from features on the top secret side here. Um, so for example, based on the public information, we can go and look at the um, full date of birth, the relationships, um, and basically just quantify with a certain probability as to whether or not we've been successful at identifying something that is not public about each of us. So without any further ado, I'll just pass over to Neri for the analysis. How do we do this in practice? Yes, so for the analysis, we uh, decided to look at a sample set of people 
and we thought what better than to go for data scientists uh, since this is a pi data talk and maybe people in this room or at this conference will actually be in our data set. So we started off, um, let's, let's have a look at data scientists. What is a better place to find the collection of data scientists than Twitter? So we start off with Twitter. Let's do some data collection on Twitter. Well, data collection on Twitter is quite, quite simple. You've got an API to Twitter. You make an API with Tweepy. I'm not sure whether you've used Tweepy, but it's an amazing tool to just connect to Twitter with. Uh, so you connect to the API, you get some API keys. And that, that's quite straightforward. And all you have to do is really just search for data scientists. It's, it's that simple. So to target any kind of community, all you have to do is just start off and uh, search Twitter for people in that category and you get loads of data scientists or just to place this by any other kind of group that you want to be targeting and there you go. So first of all, uh, we search Twitter for data scientists. We get a full collection of data scientists from Twitter. We then do feature extraction from that because Twitter gives us back the name, the description that you give. When you actually join Twitter, favorite accounts, whether your geo geolocation is enabled, lots of people have la location and language enabled, so that kind of tells you where you are. And then from there, we actually do some machine learning and we uh, fit a k-means clustering. So we're trying to, at that point, kind of sample down our data scientists and target individuals. So no longer are we looking at a community, but we want to find those figures in your community that are lead figureheads. So we want to go after and look at who's important in data science and what have they been up to and what can we find out about them. So to kind of narrow that down again, we do k-means and we try and cluster the data scientists and then find that important cluster that has more connections and more people following and just focus on that. And that's where our analysis begins. Yes, yeah, so let's make this a bit more interesting, right? So I've got a data set of seemingly very um, non-intrusive information that people were willing to um, provide on their Twitter account. Some of them provide more information, some of them less. Um, basically what I'm taking is I'm taking this dump of um, Twitter data and let's look at very simple data. Um, you have name, uh, first name, last name, you have a user account um, and let's just simply take that information and I'll walk you through the degrees of separations, um, what kind of levels we can, uh, degrees we can actually um, uh, build on to. So the first one, as I said, public Twitter people information, name, location, username, very easy. The next degree is um, we're trying to do kind of a personal individual matching. Um, for that, we can use different sources. There are people search engines, um, different APIs. For example, Pipple, it will provide you instantly with from the information that we get from Twitter, which could be, you know, you have you can have a name that uh, that could represent different people because it's a popular name. You know, the surname is not unique. With that, you can actually drill down to have a full name, um, additional usernames or accounts, um, and other aliases on virtual presence. That's the first degree. Let's go further. Second degree. We can do from an individual matching, uh, going further to kind of an, an account matching and social matching and looking at all different kinds of um, accounts that you registered for. So obvious ones, social network present, Google+, LinkedIn, Facebook, um, uh, photo sites, Flickr, Pinterest. Um, also, you can have uh, searches on government sites, land registrations, um, uh, you can look for um, car licenses, voters list, publications if you've written a book, attended conferences, um, you can look for geolocations, Google Latitude, um, also mobile da data. Um, those kind of accounts that you've created, um, we can match with the personal matching. The next degree would be based on the information that we're now building up is profile building. So based on, for example, Google Plus or LinkedIn, we can infer that you work somewhere or you're affiliated with a company and we can look up your, where you work, where, where the office is, which city, which building. We can look up your work email address. We can look for personal data, right? So we can um, search for you, when was your birthday? Um, as Yanis mentioned, so, uh, you know, some information might be already available on Google Plus, the, the month, the date. You can look for um, tweets, happy birthday, it's your 30, you know, 30th or, or 40th, you know, as a 
around the birthday. Um, you can look for personal email addresses. You can look for, um, do you have a car? you have a house? Did you buy a flat? Um, um, all kinds of very interesting information. Mobile, obviously, we're going into the uh, Internet of Things, mobile presence, multiple devices. Um, very interesting space in terms of mobile presence of, of, of a person. Um, and then you can also have Maybe uh, some of you have a, a private website, a personal website. We can look up registration data. Um, uh, where is the person registered? Um, um, uh, where is he living? What's his telephone number? What's his email address that he's registered for? And then look up. Okay, so what's the email provider? Where you you know where where you use that um, email address and which profiles? You can also do very interesting search on images, right? So you have an image um, uploaded on your avatar in Google Plus or, or Facebook. You can do image searches. You can Im Im image matching. Um, so we built kind of a, a profile of the individual, and then we can go up another degree. Um, we call that real-time location pattern building. So, for example, you take a picture at a conference or at home, you upload that to Flickr or Google+, Plus. but guess what? It has excess information. It might have geolocation in it. It might have what phone you used, um, um, you know, at what place, at what time. Um, with, you know, it might even um, include comments of, um, you've edited that with Photoshop on your MacBook Pro, right? It, it has loads of information. And those are kind of example steps of degrees of separation. Um, which can be obviously um, built up further as well. So just as an example, um, we that, you on there, right? that, 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 that you can see that how this actually works or how do you, you can get um, data for specific people. We, we've picked Nary just for an example. So the starting point was the Twitter account, which is you know seemingly very um, non-intrusive data. We have a name and we have a, an account um, uh, username. Nothing more, no date of birth, no, you know, nothing. Um, from that, um, we managed to link it to her Google Plus account, which instantly gave us location data where she lives. Um, you can have also behavior patterns where she goes to the gym or if she runs, things like that. Um, on Google Plus, you also find that she has a birthday on the 21st of April, but well, we don't have a year, so it's 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 just you know one additional information that we can build up for on, but. Guess what? We can do further searches, and it turns out she was born uh, on the 21st of April in 19, uh, which is it, 18, 87. 87. Yeah. I should disclose a lady's <laughs> um, we, can, we can see where she's working, where she had her education. We can see um, what kind of phone she's using from uh, Exif data. And we can also see pictures on a, from, from her wedding. So you, you can see um, this kind of build-up can go quite far, quite deep, and, and you know you can build up extensive information that you can then combine and link. Um, so what, 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 are we, what do we do with this information? This is kind of a, a workflow starting from uh, a data collection of a simple Twitter um, uh, feed and, and Twitter information that we were gathering through a Python script. And what we're doing is we enhance that with all these information that I walked through, the, the degrees of separation, and then feed that back into it. And I'll hand over to Neri to show you how we do that. Right, first of all, I, I think I must thank you for not sharing any of my actual secrets, which I know you have found, and sadly are out there as well. Um, but obviously we want to go back to the data science of it now. We now know what Adam knows and how we should be doing this and how all these data sources work together. And actually he's given me the sources of all of this data. So all we actually have to do is combine it at mass. So we have to build a bigger picture of just not a few people like we've been doing, like he's been building on me and a few other data scientists. But what we need to be doing is building um, profiles and descriptions for everybody in that particular community. And then we can use some more interesting machine learning things and find those data points which are actually quite interesting and which are actually secrets about people that we can actually find and which is out there. And it's, it's kind of really scary that we can do this, but just combining these different degrees. And there's so many degrees, you can really find out things about individuals or things about communities as a whole. How do we behave? Where do we, where do we go? What do we do? Um, how do you use us more, uh, more effectively? How do you get to this community? How do you infiltrate that community? So it shouldn't just stop at um, analyzing and profiling individuals, but we should do that at scale and use data science and the skills that we have to, to combine our skill sets and do good instead of evil, obviously. Um, yes, so collect more data, learn everything again, and, and all, all is well in the world. Mm. <laughs>
tweak those data sources, yes. basically. So what happens when we combine forces is, I think, basically, we, we were able to um, extract more information that would otherwise be very difficult to harvest if you didn't have that um, zoom-in perspective that Adam has provided with the sources. Having that then being fed back as knowledge to the models that uh, Neri has put together meant that straight away we were able to basically gather more information without having to worry about whether or not um, that information is basically not induced or inferred from uh, public data. No active attacks were take, took place um, within uh, the gathering of this information, so we didn't send anyone an email to click on a link or actively pursue or target individuals. It was more about the automation side of, of things. Um, on the second bullet, uh, there are a number of data sources in the public domain that by themselves, a singular entity, um, entities, um, do not um, give you a lot in terms of harvesting and sampling that data. But when you take those data sources uh, that we provided to Neri, uh, you have an extra edge in your analysis of, of the data. So the analysis aspect we've called basically degrees of separation in the context of us not getting anything that is private about you, but adding another angle as to how we look at the data that already exists and is publicly available. So in conclusion, You've learned a new concept, that of degrees of separation, and hopefully we've given you some food for thought with regards to how you can combine sources in order to infer information which otherwise we consider private. Let's look at if there are any questions. Silence. So as an, as an individual, what do you do if you want to do your public things, but then at the same time uh, it's, you're concerned about people combining them and getting too much information about it? Maybe there's nothing, but it's one of those philosophical questions of what do you make public and, and, and yet again, and, and then again still keep some privacy? That's a very good question. There's a quote that says, um, if you uh, want total security, go to prison. You will be clothed, fed. The only thing lacking is freedom. Um, al along those lines, um, be extra careful about what you share and with whom. Um, ve very often, without having been targeted, uh, people will share information that really should not be out there. Um, and especially if you're in the public domain, uh, there is a process whereby uh, we take through uh, people uh, about what it is that you should be basically putting out there and what it is that you shouldn't. So um, an example would be don't use a wireless hotspot that asks for your date of birth. Right? Just don't use it. Um, that, that piece of information is more valuable to someone taking a mortgage in your name than that wireless connection will ever be in your life. So it's about just balancing that trade-off. How do you learn about those things that you should or you should not? Well, you speak to Adam. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, there are no, so there's a, there's a number of online resources on this. There's the Safe and Secure Online. Um, there's a number of, we, we do training uh, within our community, the information security and insurance community for children in terms of making sure that um, what they share online in their chats is information that you know can be shared. Um, so there are a number of available resources online on, on this. Uh, what's scary is that we haven't trained the adults um, who are part of, if you like, the first generation. The second generation is being equipped with knowing how to handle this, but the first generation is not really aware. There's, uh, just to add to that, there's also kind of a tendency that if you want to achieve something or get something or buy something, that you're willing to give more just in order to get that. But you, you should always think about um, 
in terms of when you want to get that, what information do they actually need, right? If I get a mortgage, I probably need to give them my um, bank details and date of birth. But if I, um, I don't know, you know, buy a book, they should know what my date of birth is. It doesn't matter, right? As long as I pay. So, so you, you need to kind of think of what kind of information you actually have to give to the person to achieve what you want to. But usually, the, the, uh, as Yannis said, with the younger generation, they're, they're a bit more reluctant to do that. And also, you can see that on social presence. But um, usually, if, if I want to buy the iPhone, I'll sign up for everything, right? Yeah, I just click yes, yes, yes. And you know, they want my date of birth, they want my email address, whatever. I'll just give it, right? Because I want it. Um, but you always have to think about, do they actually really need that? Or do they require that information? Because once you hand it over, it's gone. It's not in your you basically gave over the classification to someone else or it might be hacked and it's out there and it's public. There was another question. Oh, is it? I mean, the situation actually is, uh, actually I find it even worse among the younger generation because a lot of times they're already, they, they're already in the social network and they sign up for certain chat rooms or whatever and they're not understanding what it means. They would put on their real birthdays, right, and all of that. Uh, and these are the questions, like for example, you want to uh, for bank accounts. These are what you use, right? Your mother, mother's maiden name, and all of this are information that people can actually go get them. So it's actually, I, I think the cut is out of the back. I think that what is more important is training the organizations like LinkedIn and Microsoft and Google never to ask those questions. Because they are the culprits, they are the ones that created the problem. So, but, but you are the one who's giving the information Twitter, to them. LinkedIn, Google Plus, they are the ones that just stop doing that. And people like yourself in information security should tell them that. There's, there's. Can you repeat slash summarize for the recording? Yes. So I think I think the um, the question of the gentleman in the front row is one of, um, well, it wasn't a question; it was a statement on um, should we not be asking more of the big corporations in, in basically being responsible for our data, be it Microsoft, Google, etc. Fair summary? Yes. I think, I think the only comment I would say to that is there is a reason why all those services are free. So I have accepted the risk that Google is mining me as an entity on the basis of having a Gmail account with them. Um, having said that, could they make it more clear? Yes, absolutely. There's no doubt about that. Um, James. So I think one of the common criticisms of supervised learning is its ability to run circles around the data scientist by inferring things that the data scientist didn't quite expect, kind of cheating. So one of the characteristic examples of this is the, the apocryphal story about the super expensive military project where they're trying to discover camouflage tanks, and it turns out all the pictures of the camouflage tanks were taken on a clear day, and all the pictures the non-camouflage tanks were taken on a cloudy day, and the trained algorithm could only actually determine whether it was a cloudy day or a clear day. And it didn't work at all. But it occurs to me that this kind of deep mystical inference is essentially potentially a mechanism for side channel attacks. And I'm curious whether the information security community tries to do side channel attack research via machine learning, whether they, whether they throw an enormous num amount of sensor data at something and then try to see what can be inferred from that develop non-targeted attacks in that fashion. Neri, do you want to comment on that? Well, I think uh, what I've learned from working with these can, two... Can you repeat? Yes, if you could summarize, James. Okay, so um, can does, does the security industry um, mine a lot of data to kind of find attacks? Uh, is that a fair summary of your question? And specifically a side channel attack. Side channel. A side channel attack. attack where you are trying to, for example, you're trying to infer somebody's password from listening to the strokes, the keystrokes that they take, right? right. The, the sound patterns of that. Or yes. the induction of some circuit inside the computer that will result on some antenna. Yes, so I've, I've found that a lot of security people aren't really aware of the data science skill set or technologies even available. So they do a lot of stuff brute force, so they have their ways of getting that side channel attack anyway because of the way they do things, they plan bugs, they'll hack into your computer and get a keylogger, but they're not really using that massive amount of data to kind of do that yet. So I think we have large opportunities to combine our fields, which isn't, which we're not really there yet, as in it's not really being done as of yet because the skill sets just haven't been combined as much as they can be. So I think that we should be working together more in the security industry 
to kind of prevent these attacks as well, because obviously this this might just be happening right now and we're just not aware of it. So for both, both for protection and well, not only for protection, we don't want to attack anybody. So so just just to add to that, so James, if if we were part of a criminal organization and wanted your date of birth, we would get it. Right? And on the attacking technique, you always use the attack that requires the least amount of energy. It's a standard principle. It dates back to ancient times. Um, so we would not use passive techniques like this because basically that would be an objective. Um, now, where you're not talking to criminals, but professionals, uh, vetted professionals, that would not be an option. Plus, it wouldn't be morally correct to do that without your consent. So where we now see a spike of such activity is with governments uh, mining data up to the limit of what they can harvest without being in breach of current privacy regulations. And there's a big debate on security versus privacy. Um, I think we're going to see a lot more of that because more and more people don't want to break the law. Yes, but if I may ask a follow-up, but bottom line as an approach is this kind of dragnet approach. I think side channel attacks are typically attacks where you have a specific target. So for example, if you wanted to guess my password, the typical approach would be try all the common passwords or data mine some information about me, or try the name of my dog, and you know, the name of my first high school, whatever. But you could think a very common thing in machine learning would be sit me in front of a camera and have me type in my password 100 times, and then notice every time I type the W character, I blink a little bit deeper, and then infer from that my password, right? And these very weird inferences kept collected over a large number a large numbers of data. And you could think that if you could use that to infer a side channel attack, for example, there must be some physiological response when somebody types their password or types certain keys. There's certainly an auditory response related to the travel of the, between the different keys. You might be able to discover side channel attacks to target specific individuals, guess their mm -hmm. passwords or guess things like that. That might be completely indefensible because how do you change your breathing to make sure you're not you know, revealing information through that side channel? Yes, and ultimately, you know, the human is the, the weakest link there. I mean, there's no, there's no other doubt about it. I, I don't think we've got time for another question. So I'd like to thank everyone for, for attending, uh, and hopefully you, you've learned something new. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.